Greetings, welcome to the Evidence Reasons Academy. Glory and honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This channel serves uh, believers in particular to teach them the science that they need to understand creationism. We also cover other topics. Tonight, um, I'm joined by my co-host, Cindy Lincoln. And greetings, Cindy. I believe this is, we're up to part five in molecular biology. Uh, tonight, uh, I worked out, uh, we're doing this by a recording first because we can clear some copyrights. Uh, it's kind of funny how it works. Even if a uh, the authors will allow you to use their material, and if, it's, if they have a copyright, they're okay with you using it, but then YouTube will not let you use it for a live stream. They will let you use it for a recording. So uh, that's one reason we're doing this via recording. And this is copyrighted material by Illustra Media that we're going to show a lot tonight. I think this will put a lot of context to everything, why I particularly emphasize studying stuff at the molecular level. So a little bit about molecular biology. It's becoming a little bit of a misnomer because molecular biology deals with this mostly built around the central dogma of molecular biology. But there's so much beyond the central dogma of molecular biology. So there are, there are various ways to phrase it. And there's not, historically, there's not been uniform agreement on what the central dogma means. We had two Nobel Prize winners, Watson and Crick. They share the Nobel Prize for their discovery of the structure of DNA. Although, um, to be fair, a lot of people feel it should have gone to Rosalind Franklin, but sadly she died. Uh, they took her work and got a lot of credit for her work, which is also kind of sad. Uh, I mean, I need, I feel a moral obligation to set that part of the record straight. It's just how it goes. Um, and I'm glad the history books are at least acknowledging her tremendous contribution. She died because the experiments that were needed to uncover the structure of DNA with the technology they had then exposed her to a lot of radiation and it led to her um, untimely passing. So Watson and Crick had slightly different phrasings of the central dogma. And, you know, Cindy Lincoln's really sharp. She went back, combed through my channel. And she said, Sal, you weren't teaching me the exact one. And I said, yeah, I know that. But she caught me on it. She's a smart cookie. She said, you were teaching me Watson's version. That's not exactly the right one. And they're like, yeah, I told you. That's why I said approximation, approximation. Uh, there's, you know, and I said, do you want, do you want the one by Levin? Hardly anyone uses that. And it's not, it's not critical. You get every word down. This isn't, you know, this isn't like a, a theological creed. Um, if you can get the approximation that's good enough uh, to get going. What's more important is to understand the mechanics and then the mechanics as far as, you know, all the mach molecular machinery involved. If you get that right, who cares about the creed? That's the amazing part. Yes. So, Cindy, how about you give your version, approximate version of the central dogma? It's not my version. It's what you taught me. Okay. Okay, DNA transcribes to RNA, which translates to proteins. Very good. <laughs> okay, qualify it though. Say uh, it is approximately, approximately, and so, and and you'd so be fine. It. Be, because as I as I pointed as no, say it. Say it how you would say it. Okay. Approximately, the central dogma is DNA transcribes to RNA, RNA transcribes to proteins. Translates. Translate. See, you got me. You're learning. <laughs> okay. And I made a mistake there. Translates to proteins. The Probably the, the one that I would feel the most comfortable with is saying approximately DNA can transcribe to RNA. And our, some RNA can translate to proteins because okay. we're finding we're finding a lot of DNA does not transcribe to RNA. 
refining a lot of RNA does not translate to proteins. That's why I framed it. There's probably a nicer way to say that, but you can kind of keep yourself out of trouble. And you did catch me. Good on you. Bad on me. Score one for Cindy tonight. You remember my trick between the difference between transcribe and translate? Late no, late. you had a good one. Late comes late. Translate comes, comes late. late. Very yeah, good. Transcribe. Yeah. If All I right, didn't so, have that, I wouldn't have remembered. So the thing is, is that you'll start to, whatever the wording of it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's more helpful to know what the molecules involved in the processes. And then really for our purposes, we're not trying to, we're not trying to train ourselves to be um, research scientists in, you know, where we take apart cells, put them in the centrifuge and then do all these chemical experiments that are just tedious and laborious. Our purpose is, is to understand it, to understand God's creation. And thankfully, I have found that you do, one does not need to spend four years in university to get the requisite chemistry, cellular biology, molecular biology. It can be done by watching videos and getting, you know, the takeaways. So when James Tour is speaking on like abiogenesis against thumbed up Farina, um, <laughs> he, does, he doesn't have to have, I mean, his audience is sophisticated, but there's a lot you can learn just listening to him. And he's a chemistry professor. He knows not everyone understands all the fine details of what he's saying, but he can get, you can get enough to know. So that really is kind of our goal. You know, we could, it's fine if anyone has the passion and God puts it on their heart that they're going to study this at a formal university level and be able to pass all the exams. That's glorious. That's the way to study and declare the works of God. Um, so what we're going to do tonight, and I, I have told people, you know, I've had people that have my little teeny tiny minuscule fan club approaches me and said, Sal, what do you think if I do this? How about I, how about I get all the evolutionary biology books I can so I can refute it? Why don't I do that? And I just like, oh no, don't do that. Don't do that. Watch these videos of transcription, translation, replication, watch them 20 times over. That'd be worth a lifetime, several lifetimes of wasted of studying evolutionary biology. You'll get more out of that. And so that's what we're going to do today. But this will also be in the context of the topic of intelligent design. So before you go on to your next thought, what you just said about not going into the textbooks, is that because it's kind of like the example of counterfeit money? If you want to recognize counterfeit, you don't study the counterfeits, you study the real thing. It might be. I would say yes, a qualified yes, because I'm just I haven't really thought about that, but I'd say, yeah, go ahead. Because I thought thing, about doing the textbook thing too. But you know, the thing is, is evolutionary biology is so much of a myth on just just why would I waste spec this would be like me. Would I am I gonna spend more hours reading the Bible or studying other religions? That's kind of the counterfeit thing. Yeah. I mean, if you're professionally having to try to refute a false religion, you're going to have to invest time in it. But as someone that That's is odd. not, yeah, yeah. If you're not, if that is, you know, but him at that stage, because he wasn't even a biology student, I said, you're going to be at this stage in your life, you're going to be better served studying just watching these videos, I said, watch it 20 times. You're going to be so much more blessed. And yeah, now I one has like a spirit of uh, strife and oppression. And the other has the spirit of wonder and awe and glory. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, by the way, guys, I got to tell you, I, I figured out I could put cocoa in my coffee. I have Me all this. Too. There's all this, that this morning. There's all this spare cocoa that you know my sister loved to bake, and she lived when my dad was sick. She's a she's a registered nurse, and dad was ill in 2003. She left all this extra cocoa. Okay, now that's 
that's 19 years ago and I wasn't sure it was going to hold. It's still good. And I mixed it in my coffee because I'm trying to dispose of things. And okay, I got it. All right. You biochemistry students are going to cringe because I got I got a donut. I got a donut here and I put it in the microwave and it's so nice when it's warmed up to eat. So we're going to watch movies. I'm not going to eat popcorn. It's be donuts and coffee uh, on a nice cold winter night here. And um, so uh, we're going to watch the Lustre Media videos and we're going to learn molecular biology this way, but then also find it in the context of the creation evolution controversy. Now, I should say, what's the difference between creationism and ID? I would like to hear what Cindy, what, you know, what her, just if she, how she distinguishes this, and then I'll give my, my take before we get into I this. I don't know what Meyer says or the ID guys, how they describe it, but the my take on it is that they can, the ID proponents say that you can see that there's intelligence and design, but they don't, let's see. And a lot of them do attribute it to Jesus. Okay. But so don't, wait a minute. You're going to have to explain that to me. Okay. This is why it's important. Okay. One's it's, young earth and one's old earth. So why don't I, why don't I take the historical roots of this? Historically, we can trace this even way back to pagan writings where they were saying there has to be an intelligence that made the universe. You look at the writings of Aristotle, uh, not Aristotle. It, it was one of the great Greek philosophers, but then even Cicero. Cicero in Roman times, several decades BC, was right before the time of Christ. And, and and he made that observation. He said, you know, so he's a pagan, but he's saying this had all, there had to be an intelligence that put all this together. So an there's just an, deist, an unidentified deity. I think the Romans were, they're pagans. They believe they're polytheists. We Christians are monotheists. Pagans are polytheists, but he was still saying, why don't I read what Cicero had to say on intelligent design? And so let's hear it from the word of a pagan. But th this is still important because um, it, it's showing that we're able to arrive at these conclusions just by observation. We don't have to be, it's, we don't begin with a religious text. If you look at Mount Rushmore, or you look at anything, it's like, okay, we know probably a human mind made it, but there's certain characteristics of things that look created. Now, for the whole universe, for life, it's like, well, if we could see God in action with our own eyes, yeah, that it'd be a done deal that it's intelligent design. But even if you don't see the designer, would you conclude that it looks at least like an intelligence made it, something that's very human-like? So... Um, Got saved. I was not raised in the church. There was no Bible in my house when I was growing up. But my dad took me to Yosemite, to Yellowstone, to the Grand Canyon, to Snake River, and I could see God's that there was a God. And that he made it good, but that we messed it up. To me, as a kid, that was obvious. Okay, praise God for that. And what does it say in Romans chapter 1, 18 through 20? His but, eternal power for, for, the, um, for his invisible qualities, his divine nature and eternal power are clearly seen in the things that are made. And it's like, how can you see something that you can't see? Well, I think of a sonogram. You really can't see the sound waves but you can reconstruct it so you can get a visualization. I think sonograms are incredible. You're able to actually see sound traveling through 
a woman's womb and and showed, Jesus used the example of wind you can't see the wind but you can see what it does yeah but then i've heard i think it was mckinnon mitchell who did that documentary on kent and he said well romans one is he was mocking it saying um Oh yeah, Romans 1 is all you need. There you go. There it is. You're guilty. And I thought it was interesting how he flipped that. But I think it's because of other things like, well, if God was real, then why is he allowing all this evil? Or if God was real, he wouldn't um, try and hide himself. Or, you know, all these things they they are they allow to get between them and god okay we will have another we've had other shows on that but just briefly it's the glory of god to conceal a matter is the glory of kings to search it out the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field and the kingdom of heaven is god himself ultimately it's hidden in the field and there and jesus said I thank you, heaven. I thank you, God of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and learned it. Hidden these things from the wise and learned, but revealed them unto little babes. Unto so, um, God, Jesus is glorifying our heavenly Father from concealing Himself from people that want nothing to do with Him. And you know, Sal, think about it. In the Garden of Eden, He was not hidden. He was walking with them every day mm. and in the cool of the evening and they still rejected him well in any case going back to the topic of intelligent design versus creationism because yeah. we're going to study intelligent design and you're going to see how it's different than the way we teach creationism i would say briefly this if you're a creationist you believe in intelligent design automatically However, if you believe in intelligent design, you don't necessarily believe in creationism. So that's the way I say it. But if, if you believe in intelligence, that would be the creator. Well, there are there are people that believe in, okay, intelligent design. Some of them believe intelligent design because of space aliens. Okay, I reject that, but there are people some of the best intelligent design theorists are space alien advocates. One of them was Fred Hoyle. Okay. Another one says, well, the universe is intelligent. There's no God outside of the universe, but the universe is kind of like a God itself. It's pantheistic. Um, you know, it's just, all right. How can uh, an intelligent person think that the alien solution is a solution when it just basically moves the problem back problem elsewhere okay so i'm not going to try to be an apologist for that i'm just pointing that out and then you have the pagans who have their version why don't i read this from cicero yeah, yeah. okay so let's um okay so present screen and it's almost quarter of midnight and I got a text. I'm a little concerned. Let me just check it to just alleviate it's not an emergency. If you'll give me one second. Oh my, okay, no emergency. I got a text from uh, Mrs. Pigeon, um, so I, I'll look at it. I, I presume I'll have to attend to it. Uh, God bless Mrs. Pigeon. She's um, Sandy, Sandy Pigeon's our resident Navy SEAL who's been on our show here at Evidence Reasons Academy. Um, God bless her. She has helped me make some important decorating decisions for my home, like choosing a color of paint for for uh, painting my home. So, And the flooring, too. Didn't she help you with that? That was Rebecca. Okay. So, yeah, you, you let the girls make the decision. 
<laughs> Aww. guys are like, yeah, whatever, you he know. Has humility. Um. Anyway, um. Let's read this Stoicism. Okay, this is Cicero, and this is um, this is someone found this out. So we got some good scholars at the Discovery Institute. So let me just read this. Uh, Stoicism was a philosophy that was founded in Athens in 300 BC and became popular in the Roman Empire among such leaders as Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. In these selections from Cicero's On the Nature of Gods, 45 BC, Cicero outlines the basic Stoic argument about design and nature. The selections come from Book 2, Chapters, I can't, 37, 44, and... <laughs> XL. Oh man, that would 47. be 47. I can't read that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Who would not deny the name? Who would not deny the name of, hu of human being to a man who, on seeing the regular motions of the heaven and the fixed order of the stars and the accurate interconnection and interrelation of all things, can deny? that these things possess any rational design and can maintain that phenomena, the wisdom of whose ordering transcends the capacity of our wisdom to understand it, take place by chance. When we see something moved by machinery like an or ori or a clock or many other such things, we do not doubt that these contrivances are the work of reason. When, therefore, we behold the whole compass of the heaven moving with revolutions of marvelous velocity, and executing with perfect regularity the annual changes of the seasons with absolute safety and security for all things, how can we doubt that all this is affected not merely by reason, but by reason that is transcendent and divine? Can any sane person believe that all this array of stars and this vast celestial adornment could have been created out of atoms rushing to and fro fortuitously and at random? Or could any other being devoid of intelligence and reason have created them. Not merely did their creation postulate intelligence, but it is impossible to understand their nature without intelligence of a high order. To come now from things celestial to things terrestrial, which is there among these latter which does not clearly display the rational design of an intelligent being, in the first place, with the vegetation that springs from the earth, the stalks both give stability to parts which they sustain and draw from the ground, the sap to nourish the parts upheld by the roots, and the trunks are covered with bark or rind, the better to protect them against cold and heat. Again, the vines cling to their props with their tendrils as with hands, and thus raise themselves erect like animals. Nay, more, it is said that if planted near cabbages, they shun them like pes pestilential, and noxious things and will not touch them at any point. Again, what a variety there is of animals and what capacity they possess of persisting true to their various kinds. Kinds! <laughs> Some of them are protected by hides, other are clothed with fleeces, other bristle with spines. Some we see covered with feathers, some with scales, some armed with horns, some equipped with wings to escape their foes. Nature, however, has provided with bounteous plenty for each species of animals, that food which is suited for it, I might show in detail what provision has been made in the forms of the animals for appropriating and assimilating this food. How skillful and exact is the disposition of the various parts, how marvelous the structure of the limbs, for all the organs, at least those contained within the body, are so formed and so placed that none of them is superfluous or not necessary for the preservation of life. And this was written 45 BC. No junk. Isn't that incredible? Yes. Now, right. I'll tell you what's really interesting. Darwin agreed with half of that, amazingly. Um, Darwin. Can I say something if that I, I learned? Please, while I'm looking this up, please. One of my commenters told me to look up Dr. Jeff Schloss, I believe. I might be getting the name wrong. But he pointed out 
what you were just talking about was order in the cosmos. And he pointed out that the word cosmos actually means order as opposed to chaos. Cosmos and chaos are antithesis. And I had never known that. And I Googled the origin of the word and sure enough, cosmos means order. And he was talking about the planets and how they go at great speeds. I don't know how fast the orbits are, but I do know that they are like clockwork. Oh, we're starting to know. They're... I do know that okay. they're like clockwork. Like you can so... go back in time and predict what the sky would look like in at any time. It's, it is like a giant clock in the sky. The orbits are like gears. The clock gears. I thought that was cool, Sal. You're supposed to say that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. There you go. You. All right. So Charles Darwin. All right. So Charles Darwin is nuanced. He says, okay, this is what he said. He's an agnostic. All right. He said this, another source of conviction in the existence of God connected with the reason with the reason and not with the feelings impresses me as having much more weight. This follows from the extreme difficulty or rather impossibility of conceiving this immense and wonderful universe, including man with his capacity of looking far backwards and far into futurity as the result of blind chance or necessity. When thus reflecting, I feel compelled to look at to a first cause, having an intelligent mind in some degree analogous to that of man, and I deserve to be called a theist. The conclusion, this conclusion was strong in my mind about the time, as far as I can remember, when I wrote The Origin of Species. And, and it is since that time that it has very gradually, with many fluctuations, become weaker. So we had this strong conviction, it's a little weaker, but then arises doubt, the doubt, can the mind of man, which has, as I fully be, believe, been developed from a mind as low as that possessed by the lowest animal, be trusted when it draws on such a grand on such grand conclusions? May not these be the result of the connection between cause and effect, which strikes us as a necessary one, but probably depends on merely inherited experience? Nor must we look, overlook the probability, the constant inculcation in a belief in God wait, on the minds. Wait, wait, wait. What's he imputing it to? Inher inherited experience? Okay. All right. So he had it right the first paragraph. Later in life, he started to weaken, and he's describing all of his ideas. He said, nor must me look over the probability, the constant inculcation and a belief in God on the minds of children, producing so strong and perhaps an inherited effect on their brains, not yet fully developed, that it would be difficult for them now to throw off their belief in God. As for a monkey to throw off its instinctive fear and hatred of a snake, I cannot pretend to throw the least light on such abstruse problems. The mystery of the beginning of all things is insoluble by us, and I, for one, must be content to remain an agnostic. But I was just saying, he didn't totally reject, okay, he had a very strong sense at one time in his life that there had to be a God, much like, you know, kind of along echoing Cicero. He was weakened by his stupid theory. Well, his, that's what I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand that paragraph, the paragraph. Well, that you're not alone. Out of it. Darwin's writing is so terrible, you can't understand what he's saying. It's my opinion. I said, what? You know, sometimes you write it so clearly, and then you go backtrack, and I can't get what you're trying to say. But, you know, uh, maybe... He's cutting, cutting and pasting other people's ideas. He's a plagiarist too, so um, <laughs> that can explain some of it. But Basically, I'm just saying, it looks like just dropping keywords to make it look like he knows what these. It's like name dropping almost. But the point is, is that he didn't. He's not an absolute atheist. He he's like, well, you know, agnostic. Yeah, you can't, I mean, I thought his opening paragraph, you can't look at this and not feel something. It's well, just it's, like. It's the contrast between um, 
random chance and not random. No, that is what both Cicero and Darwin referred to. But when you talk to, when you debate an atheist, they're saying, well, we're never saying it's random. Uh, natural selection is not random and, or other forms of. Well, you know what? Let's assume it's not random. We have experiments that prove it degrades complexity. So it's not random. It does. It just doesn't do what you think. It, it well, is, it is. The order, get, the order is what's leading us to the, the, it their, does, it, a deity. it doesn't lead to organization. It may not be random, but it doesn't lead to organization. Okay. If I, if I have a jackhammer and I'm, systematically taking apart something that's not random but it doesn't lead to complexity you know that's an interesting take on it so the question of whether or not the universe is random or designed okay this is where it starts to get okay cicero's art ar arguments darwin's arguments are not modern day to the modern day level of understanding when I teach intelligent design, I use the coins. I say, understand the binomial distribution, the law of large numbers, binomial distribution. You apply that to chemistry, you will see that life is a violation of the law of large numbers. Therefore, it's reasonable to assume a miracle of some sort. Mathematically speaking, it is a miracle whether we would say it's a miracle in the metaphysical sense, you know, or is it just an extremely lucky event? At what point do you decide it's, it's an act of God versus an extremely lucky event? I think well, every person- When the probabilities are under, under zero, it's not, it's beyond large numbers. It's, right. it's but not we, happening. Well, we're able now to formalize things, um, you know, in a way that they couldn't. We have a lot more of the mathematical sophistication. So when James Tour is giving his early parts, a look at, he said, how can you, you know, how'd that happen? And it's like, you see, we know now from chemistry, they're, they're natural disorganizing tendencies because of the chemicals involved. Just like coins will not spontaneously organize themselves to be all heads, there's an inherent, well, in the case of coins, we have these um, inertia, you can describe them in terms of inertia tensors. They are inherently unstable and they will reflect the randomness of the environment. Um, they will not tend to be all heads or all tails. And they're, they're it's a little bit rig. It's difficult to actually rigorously show that, but you, you will get outcome. We, we'd study these uh, things like called the tennis racket theorem, where you, you cannot, you're guaranteed not to have stability in an outcome. And so the chemical systems also have inherent instability in them. Now, yeah. creationists, unfortunately, have tried to link that to the second law of thermodynamics, and I just roll my eyes. But the way James Tour, for the 98% of the time, I get score him 98%. Correct. He gets the chemistry the way I would like to teach it. When he talks about thermodynamics or information theory, I unfortunately have to cringe. He got that from other people, not from his own research. And that's why it's not as good, in my opinion. I'll get flack for saying that just now. But um, we can codify that. But inherently, you don't, did you, did any of this, what you heard from Cicero, and I could read from others, did, did it come from like religious indoctrination? It was just like, okay, did you get your instinct about the universe when your dad was taking you out to the parks? Did, it's was that from a, creation itself? It's not from indoctrination. So, I mean, not to be too personal, but you weren't raised. You weren't not raised. There was no Bible in my home. So I guess if to some people Romans one isn't enough, to other people it is enough. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to, you know, I'm not, you know, we're going to be talking about molecular biology today, but it was good to give you context. So what's the difference between intelligent design and creationism? I'll say, if you're a creationist, you believe in intelligent design, 
But if you believe in intelligent design, you're not necessarily a Christian creationist or a young earth creationist. You could be, but it, it, intelligent design means you think some intelligence is certain features of the universe and life were made by an intelligence. That's it. Creationism goes a step further and and says, okay, this is the chronology. So what Stephen Meyer said, that I asked him specifically, what's the difference between creationism and intelligent design? He said, creationism has a chronology of events, particularly young earth creationism. Chronology, okay? This happened on day one. I know one. what chronology means, but I don't see how that... Oh, he's basically saying old earth, young earth. Well, you can distinguish it that way. But look, if you have a 747, you don't know how it, you don't know, you just know you have a an object that was intelligently designed. You may not know all the manufacturing details and when all the parts were made and when they were put together. You don't need that. Creationism, particularly young earth creationism, has a particular chronology. So you build it from the genealogy of Christ. You say less than 10,000 years ago, um, you know, in the beginning there was heaven. And that, I don't think that can be true because I think um, Muslims would consider themselves a creationist. Okay. So you can't I think Stephen, I, yeah, I think Stephen Meyer was talking about Christian creationism. I, you know, so I guess what I'll say is maybe there's not a right or wrong answer, but they are distinct. In intelligent design does not imply that you're a creationist, but if you are a creationist, it does mean you accept intelligent design. Yeah. All right. So now we, that's why we can go into molecular biology. We may not be able to recreate all of the creationism, but it's still really powerful because it starts it starts to attack Darwinian evolution, which, you know, tries to come up with a substitute designer. And and this is what you're gonna see. So you're you're the nice thing about the videos we're about to watch, we'll see pieces of molecular biology and then also criticisms of evolutionary theory and putting forward of intelligent design theory. So the reason I like intelligent design theory, I'll tell you one of them, just like instinctively what happened to you, and also comparably, not ex obviously exactly to me, is I don't want to be, when I started to doubt my faith and I had bouts of agnosticism, I said, can I, can I rebuild my faith without having to appeal to the Bible? Because what proof is there of the Bible? If I can find evidence of God outside of the Bible, then it would make it more, make it easier for me to believe in the bible and you hear atheists in debates all the time saying give me some evidence that's not in the bible mm -hmm. wow mm -hmm. i heard that last night yeah and if i were in a discussion with them i'd say what would count as evidence for you um so uh, by the way I'm, he I'm hearing some clicking i just started hearing it is someone joining us? Okay, when you when you muted your mic, I didn't hear the clicking. You can unmute yourself. No, I it's on your end. It sounds like there's a bug in our. Was there a bug in your cell phone, <laughs> crawling around? That was creepy. I still hear it when I mute it. I will stay on mute while you push play. Okay, so let's go ahead and start watching the Discovery Institute videos. You hear that? Okay, so. Yeah, it's coming. Do you have another window or something open? Do you want to uh, in in your on your phone? We'll figure it out. Let's play some. 
let's play the Illustra Media video. Okay, guys, we're going to play Illustra Media video. Uh, okay, I'm going to add this to this. Professor Philip Johnson of the University of California at Berkeley invited a group of scientists and philosophers to a small beach town on the central coast of California. They came from major academic centers, including Cambridge, Munich, and the University of Chicago, to question an idea that had dominated science for 150 years. I think Pajaro Dunes represented a turning point for many of us. Individually, we all had questions about evolutionary theory, but when we came together, each person brought something of their own to the table, and suddenly we all had a glimpse of a new way of looking at life that none of us had individually seen before. I would have to say that this was an intense period of time in my life. It just seemed that there was something here much more intellectually satisfying than the uh, view that I had held up until this time. Looking back on it now, I, I think that gave me the motivation to actually look at the evidence and just see where I, I thought it pointed. I realized that this was bigger than any one person or discipline, and this was the beginning of a community of scientists who were now willing to face the fundamental mystery of life's origin. sometimes wonder why anybody talks about anything else because this is the most interesting topic there is where do we come from how did we get here what brought us into existence what is our relationship to reality as a whole you look at the incredible diversity and complexity of life and inevitably the question arises what brought all this into existence was it simply chance and necessity undirected natural forces or is there something else going on is there a purpose, a plan, a design, a design due to an intelligent cause? I think that is the fundamental question. The scientists who came to Pajaro Dunes set out to re-examine the mystery of life's origin. For each had significant doubts about widely held evolutionary ideas. Among them, Biochemist Michael Behe questioned how natural processes could have assembled the intricate structures found within living cells. Dean Kenyon was an evolutionary biologist who no longer thought that chemistry alone could account for the origin of life on Earth. And Stephen Meyer, Paul Nelson, and William Dembski were seeking a new approach, one that could explain the origin of the genetic information encoded in living organisms. These scientists and philosophers began to formulate an alternative to the central theory of modern biology, a theory born in the mind of a British naturalist. His name was Charles Darwin.
All right, I'm going to have to start the next segment. And we're going to go to segment two. There are 12. That was segment one of 12 segments. We're going to go to segment two. And one moment, please forbear. And I'm going to segment two now. In 1831, Darwin, then 22 years old, set sail on a five-year survey expedition for the British Empire. He journeyed from England on the HMS Beagle, traveling around the southern tip of South America, then north toward a chain of volcanic islands in the Pacific called the Galapagos. On this desolate archipelago, 600 miles off the western coast of Ecuador, Charles Darwin encountered an extraordinary array of birds, reptiles, and mammals, the likes of which he had never seen before. For more than a month, Darwin studied plant and animal life, took extensive notes, and collected specimens. Then he left, never to return. 25 years passed as he developed a theory about how the diverse forms of life on Earth had originated. In 1859, Darwin published a book titled On the Origin of Species. Its impact on science and ultimately all of Western culture was dramatic. Darwin argued that all life was the product of purely undirected natural forces. Time, chance, and a process he called natural selection. For 2,500 years before Darwin, most prominent scientists and philosophers, people such as Plato or Newton or Kepler, viewed the world as the product of some kind of design or plan. But a fundamental shift occurs with Darwin's idea of natural selection, and a real change in scientific philosophy is set in motion. Darwin was not the first scientist to propose a theory of evolution, but he was the first to offer a plausible naturalistic mechanism that could produce biological change over long periods of time. To understand how natural selection works, consider the finch populations Darwin encountered on the Galapagos Islands. Thirteen species of finches inhabit the Galapagos Islands. And they vary subtly in terms of their body size and shape of the beak. Darwin returned to England with nine different species of these birds. According to contemporary Darwinian theory, differences in the sizes and shapes of the birds' beaks are the direct result of natural selection. One example often cited involves species of seed-eating finches. Following seasons of heavy rain, small soft seeds are plentiful throughout the islands. Birds with short beaks can easily gather food. However, during periods of drought, the only seeds available are encased in hard, tough shells that remain on the ground from the previous year. In these circumstances, only birds with longer, sharper beaks can crack the shells and eat the seeds. Those birds with the longer beaks survive because they can reach the food source, whereas other birds cannot. That long beak, then, confers what biologists now call a functional advantage. The finches with smaller beaks, unfortunately, die out from starvation because they cannot reach that food source. If the drought conditions continue, the environment causes a change in the features of the finch population as a whole. Over time, the long beaks are passed on to succeeding generations because those beaks enable the birds to survive. 
Natural selection was a powerful idea. Physical variations that proved advantageous would be inherited by succeeding generations. Through this process, populations would be altered, and over time, fundamentally different organisms would arise without any form of intelligent guidance. Darwin wanted to explain everything in the history of life in terms of undesigned, unintelligent natural processes. And when he looked for an explanation, what he found was that a process he could observe in domestic populations also operates in the wild. Now Darwin himself was very familiar with domestic breeding. He himself studied pigeon breeding. And he knew that for centuries, human breeders had been able to make dramatic changes in populations by selecting only certain individuals to breed. Darwin really suggested that this same process operates in the wild. For Charles Darwin, natural selection explained the appearance of design without a designer. There was no longer any need to invoke an intelligent cause for the complexity of life. In effect, natural selection became a kind of designer substitute. Today, Darwinism is generally assumed throughout science and the academic world. Yet, despite its wide acceptance, a growing number of scientists and scholars, including those who met at Pajaro Dunes, now challenge key aspects of Darwinian theory. When we came together at Pajaro Dunes, we certainly didn't agree on everything, but we did share a real dissatisfaction with the mechanism of natural selection and the role that it was playing in biological explanation. Natural selection is a real process, and it works well for explaining certain limited kinds of variation, small-scale change. We have lots of examples of that, in fact. Where it doesn't work well is explaining what Darwin thought it could, namely the real complexity of life. We have a finch beak, and then you've got the finch itself. A minor change in the structure of the beak versus the origin of the organism itself. These are different scales of phenomena. These are different kinds of problems. And the important problem for biology is to understand where natural selection works and where it doesn't and why there's a difference. Evidence is very powerful. And all of us had the sense that if we let that evidence speak for itself, that it would lead us in a very different direction, away from natural selection and towards a different conclusion about the origin and nature of life on Earth. Cindy, are you there? Yes. Okay. So, so this is a chance to just uh, pause while I reload the next episode. Uh, if you had any reflections, I know you cut out for briefly, but they're explaining natural selection in terms of the, the finch beaks and all those little finches and how yes. they the beaks. Okay, now the reason I'm trying to get the molecular biology going is you actually get to see the limits of change. It's a lot harder to see it when you're just looking at gross morphology, but there's one limit of change that even Aaron Ra admitted no. that doesn't happen gradually. There's no flipping common ancestor for all proteins. To the extent an organism to affect the change needs a new major protein family, it's not going to happen by gradual processes. Well, and in now, gradual versus rapid, they weren't even talking about that part of it. They were talking about random versus directed. And I was thinking, okay, so, well, and the other thing they were thinking of that they were referring to is natural versus supernatural. Right. Okay. But Remember... Natural Ruben. processes, even if you can say natural processes, where they come from? Well, see, it's very easy. We don't have to try to understand their convoluted Thank reasoning. You. You're right. Because I'll just say, did all proteins come from a common ancestor? And they say, and even Aaron Ra, you know, there's no flipping common ancestor for all protein, major protein families. 
when you could see it at the molecular level, if it doesn't have an ancestor, it's like now you tell me you're claiming as an evolutionist that this happened. You tell me what was the starting state? What was the process that acted on that initial state that took it to the next point? Now, I will release a little bit of something we asked Dr. Chris and Aaron Ra in one of your last emails, and I was CC'd on it. And actually, Cindy and I talked about this some, um, how should we word this? Um, and they said they don't know. And like, okay, that's fair. You believe it, you don't know. That's an act of faith. That is not the highest quality science. Fair enough. You admitted you believe it. You don't have proof. You don't have an explanation. You don't have the steps. It doesn't qualify like any other operational theory. Fine. We should probably read that. Do you want me to? Do you want me to dredge it up? This, or we? Do no, you want? To, wait a minute. I'm trying to think what you just said. If you can't show me the starting position, the process that changed it, and the ending position, then you are taking it by faith. And that that's okay. I rate. Yes. Is it okay to have, hey, I have faith, you have faith. Why, do, why is there, they, they want to say, no, but this is science. I'm like, no, I think, why don't you put it in the religion department? Then I'll right. be okay. That's the whole point. Yeah. So, so in fact, it's, it's not so much random or directed or intelligent or it's natural versus supernatural. But even well, if you try and say natural, those natural processes were divinely created they're yeah. not random so and you know if there's a natural selection process going on how can you say that there's no intelligence involved in making a selection yeah we, we can go by this in a lot of ways i don't want to deal with yeah. that right now yeah, um, it's let's, very multifaceted. Okay, so let's go to to, to section four of twelve. So we're, we're going to be a third of the way in, and I'm going to mute your mic. Um, and while we're doing this, I'll also look up that email we sent out. Okay. Just to stir up some trouble. Reducible complexity was coined by Mike Behe in describing these molecular machines. Basically what it says is that you have multi-component parts to any given organelle or system in a cell, all of which are necessary for function. That is, if you remove one part, you lose function of that system. The idea of irreducible complexity can be illustrated by a familiar non-biological machine, a mousetrap. The trap is composed of five basic pieces, a catch to hold the bait, a strong spring, a thin bent rod called the hammer, a holding bar to secure the hammer in place, and a platform upon which the entire system is mounted. If any one of these parts is missing or defective, the mechanism will not work. All components of this irreducibly complex system must be present simultaneously for the machine to perform its function, catching mice. Irreducible complexity also applies to biological machines, including the bacterial flagellar motor. All told, there are about 40 different protein parts which are necessary for this machine to work. And if any of those parts are missing, uh, then either you get a flagellum that doesn't work because it's missing the hook or it's missing the drive shaft or whatever, or it doesn't even get built within the cell. In evolutionary terms, you have to be able to explain how you can build this system gradually 
when there's no function until you have all those parts in place. The irreducible complexity of molecular machines poses a severe challenge to the power of natural selection. According to Darwin's theory, even very complex biological structures like an eye, an ear, or a heart can be built gradually over time in small incremental steps. Yet, as Darwin made clear, natural selection can only succeed if these random genetic changes provide some advantage to the evolving organism in its struggle for survival. As I have attempted to show, it is not necessary to suppose that the modifications are all simultaneous if they were extremely slight and gradual. Natural selection is scrutinizing the slightest variations, rejecting those that are bad, preserving and adding up all that are good. But could Darwin's small, favorable variations have produced a bacterial flagellum? Some scientists doubt the possibility. How could something new, like a bacteria flagellar motor and all the components that go with it, how could it develop out of a population of bacteria that don't have that system? When each change, according to Darwin's theory, has to provide some kind of advantage. Imagine such a scenario early in the Earth's history. An evolving bacterium somehow develops a tail and perhaps even the pieces necessary to attach it to the cell wall. Yet without a complete motor assembly, this innovation would provide no advantage to the cell. Instead, the tail would lie immobile and useless, invisible to natural selection, which by definition can only favor changes that aid survival. The logic of natural selection is very demanding. Unless the flagellum mechanism is completely assembled and actually works, natural selection simply cannot preserve it. It cannot be passed on to the next generation. The important thing to realize about natural selection is it selects only for a functional advantage. In most cases, natural selection actually eliminates things, things that have no function or that have a function that harms the organism. So if you had a bacterium with a tail that didn't function as a flagellum, chances are natural selection would eliminate it. The only way you can select for a flagellum is if you have a flagellum that works, and that means you have to have all the pieces of the motor in place to begin with. So natural selection can't get you the bacterial flagellum. It can only work after the flagellum is there and operating. Cindy, are you there? Yeah. Do you have some thoughts? I found the letter that we sent and some that responses. Was one of my favorite arguments, irreducible complexity, and you told me not to use that phrase, but the concept is rock solid. Why? I'll tell you why. That was rhetorical why. You can't Natural selection can't select for what doesn't exist. I was thinking, well, well duh. <laughs> if no, it's not yeah, there. But natural selection can only happen in a fully functioning organism. You can't get, if you're a hare living in Alaska, you're a brown hare or a brown fox, you can't select for white hare unless you're already a fox. <laughs> well, and see, this is what's important. The reason I'm emphasizing molecular stuff is you'll have much more, you'll have, a, you, you'll be able to back up that claim when you have the molecular stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the molecular level, you could see the limits of change. And that's important. We, we didn't quite have that until like the present day. Now it's really, it's so obvious that even R and Ross says there's no flipping common ancestor for all our proteins, but you could extend well, I, the problem elsewhere. You could I say- It's really important because they're saying 
that, for example, the parts of the flagellum, they're saying that the drive shaft was there and functional in another capacity, and then it got drafted into a new use. They're saying okay. strange things like that, like, um, like the mouse trap wouldn't function with only four of the parts, but those four parts would. <sighs> You're right. It's convoluted. Okay. Now, the argument will be strengthened, which can actually deal at the molecular level. So those parts of the flagellum are made of proteins. If there's no effing common ancestor for all proteins, and if, if to make a flagellum you need two new proteins that didn't exist before, they might have co-opted some others. You, there's still a problem there. I'm looking at a collagen system. So what they said is metazoans, those are animals that have embryos. All of them have, collagen only exists in metazoans. That's an evolutionary term, not that I really follow that much. Okay, so if you didn't have a collagen before, how did natural selection create it? And I did, today, I did a show on the difficulty of evolving collagen because I was irritated oh. with, and I said, guys, you need five proteins to make a collagen system work. In addition, you can't just have collagen. To make the collagen work, you need four four or five additional proteins at least to make collagen work. You need um, prolyl hydroxylase. You need um, uh, complex do proteins. Huh? Not just proteins, complex proteins. Complex proteins. They need uh, peptidases. To make collagen from something else? Well, you see, they can hand wave. I said, that's not science. It's faith. That's okay. Put it in the religion department, but don't call it science. Because I listed, I you know, we're in the middle of writing a paper, and I'd like to get some feedback. If any evolutionary biologists want to say that I'm wrong, you're speak now or forever hold your peace before I submit it to a journal. Um, because if it gets through a journal, I'm going to rub it in your faces. I said, you, you had the chance to shoot me down. Um, so you're saying that to go from an animal that doesn't have an embryo to an animal that does have an embryo requires the production of collagen. Is that what or, you just said? Yes, it's very or very close to it. So where did I get that? Well, I looked not only up, that, but to go from to go from something that doesn't have a cell to something that does have a cell. So uh, let me correct something. You may have an embryo without collagen, but you can't have a collagen without an embryo um, creature. I didn't say that. That was, a, that was the subject of a paper by an evolutionary biologist. Okay, so if, if I'm wrong, it's because an evolutionary biologist is wrong, and that's okay. They're wrong all the time anyway, but I'm citing their literature. So, you know, take that, and you want to argue collagen, and you know what? When we showed that diagram to Aaron, where we said, and he said there's no effing, no flipping common ancestor to all proteins, one of those proteins was collagen. <laughs> Which one? The circle one, the star I'll show one. You. Okay, I found, all right. And on, you know, Dr. Chris said we can release, our and raw, Dr. Chris said we can release our email exchanges. The four of us were having an email exchange and we were copying it. And just, I, I commend Aaron saying, you know, I, he does, he's not gonna be writing to you privately. He wants it witnessed. Dr. Chris and I witnessed it and all parties agreed we can release the emails that we're exchanging except Dr. Chris doesn't want his email address public. 
I just briefly now just cut and paste this from my email account because I don't want Dr. Chris's or anyone's email account broadcast well, public. We're not concerned about that. We're concerned about the content. Right. Well, I want to honor the people that participated and I want to be honorable to my word that we will protect their privacy. That will also give them, you know, more willing people, more willingness to let us do stuff like that. That's why I was concerned. So sometime around Thanksgiving, uh, Aaron was pressing Cindy or whatever. And I said, Cindy, uh, you know, let, we owe him a response or something. And, um, so Cindy and I talked and I said, Cindy, why don't you just ask questions? You could always ask questions. I told her, uh, Cindy, you know, uh, you have to play this like a chess game. If you make an assertion and try to prove creation, you're opening yourself up for some, a bad chess defense. Look at interaction as a game of chess. All right. Uh, that means you're going to sacrifice pieces. This is the way it's played. You can always ask questions. Just ask questions and you're safe. Just ask questions. And, you know, you're not making an assertion that you have to defend. You're just asking a question. So, uh, you know, she bounced ideas off of me. What would count as a good question? So this is what we both agreed on to send Aaron and Chris. But I said, Cindy, this is important. I feel that you should send this. Um, I don't want you to say anything that you are not willing to own. Yeah, I'm not going to make you ask a question that would bother your conscience or say anything that would bother your conscience. I want you to feel like whatever you send out, you're willing to sign your name to it. So, you know, sometimes, <laughs> free, actually frequently, Cindy and I will argue uh, over what to say. And I said, you know, it's not fair of me to try to put words in your mouth. You, you have to believe in what you say and what you sign your name to. I'm okay with that. I may not like uh, what you say, but, you know, say what is, I, I will never ask her to violate her conscience. So she just, this is, besides what you'll see in the letters should not be controversial. So this is what she said. Does the send with modification explain in sufficient detail the base roots of gene slash protein trees in the gene slash protein orchard. That was the subject. And it's, she said, Dear Aaron and Chris, biological evolutionary theory claims to explain all biodiversity. Simply put, biological evolution means descent with inherited modification. That's kind of like from the Berkeley 101 evolution site. Since all proteins, strictly speaking, the genes that code for the proteins have no common ancestor, then the relationship between major protein families is properly described by an, by an orchard of protein family trees and not by a single universal protein family tree. The base of each tree in the protein orchard does not have an ancestor. See the conceptual protein orchard below. And this is what it looks like. And Cindy asks, which one is the collagen in the diagram? It's this one right here, collagen. This one does not have an ancestor. There may be things that kind of look a little close to it, but, you know, it's hard. And they're definitely signature things that are collagen. So, question, do you claim... The basis of each tree in the protein orchard ascend, emerge by descent with inherited modification, starting from a known, verified, proven, described in detail sequence via a known, verified, proven, described in detail process in order to arrive at a known, verified, proven, <laughs> described in detail base of a tree. So our question was, let, let me... Uh, cover this again. Uh, Cindy blinked out briefly. Okay, so we are asking, okay, so Cindy, you asked where's collagen on this diagram? Yeah. This is a diagram we presented at our debate. 
Um, I gave Cindy this diagram. I used it in my presentation at Liberty University in front of their faculty, some, many, some of whom are biochemists, cellular biologists, who went to secular schools. So collagen is this one right here. So presumably each of these trees in the orchard had an ancestor. If we assume common ancestry, we're assuming for the sake of argument common ancestry. We're playing this like a chess game. So we'll assume that. So in the game of chess, you sacrifice pieces to get to your objective. So we're just assuming it for the sake of argument. We have been open about what we really believe, but we'll assume it for the sake of argument. And so we're going to assume that there's an ancestral collagen, an ancestral insulin receptor, an ancestral topoisomerase, uh, ancestral potassium channel, ancestral helicase, ancestral zinc finger. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six here. Collagen's one of them. Collagen has a very distinct spelling that will distinguish it between that and a zinc finger. And it'll be distinguished from any of these others. It's very, it's just like the fact you can distinguish a car from a helicopter. Cindy, you had something you'd like to ask? None of them look like they have a common ancestor. Both they're all distinct. Both just in like shape. A helicopter versus a horse. Yes. And also at the spelling level. So now that you know more about molecular biology and you're learning the alphabet, what's the alphabet that makes a protein? A C T G. No, that's DNA. Whoops. Oh, don't tell me. No, you have to tell me. I don't think we learned that. Amino acids. Amino acids? So no, let's pause a little bit. 20 As we amino repeat, acids make... 20, 20, 20, 20 canonical. So let's, let's just go back here. And so those proteins that we just saw are made up of amino acids. Yes. Okay, so the okay, let's go back here and we'll look at the genetic code. So your version of the central dogma of molecular biology is now why are you going back to DNA though? Because we're talking about amino acids. <gasps> DNA creates those wait a minute okay what's the what's the connection between dna and proteins state the central dogma of molecular biology well yeah dna creates the proteins but so it also must create the amino acids which create the proteins it codes it it provides the blueprint so what you see here okay so you have a c t in G, and this is just, let me, you'll see the G here. Hang on, let me shrink this. A, C, T, and G. A, C, T, and G. And then you have A, C, T, G here. Okay, so let's say uh, you have DNA that says C, C, T. Okay, C, C, T. It makes the amino acid, it codes for the amino acid proline. And CGT codes for the amino acid arginine. So CGT is a codon. It's, it's a group of three nucleotides. So that's the relationship between DNA and amino acids. Amino acids have the, are the, you could, it corresponds to the alphabet for the proteins, the parts of a protein. Each codon is an amino acid. Each codon is made of DNA. It corresponds to an amino acid. Oh, it only provides the blueprint. It's not the actual. Correct. And you see that in the central dogma of molecular biology. So 
it wouldn't hurt to state the central dogma. Even I messed it up, so you can try, give it a try one more time. Well, I can state it. I'm just trying to figure out the amino acid part of it. But you're saying, uh, okay, the central dogma is approximately that DNA transcribes into RNA which translates into proteins, which Correct. are comprised of amino acids. Very good. Which are comprised of nucleotides. No, no, amino acids are comprised, or amino acids correspond to DNA nucleotides. It corresponds. Right. You have the mapping here. In other words, the nucleotides are not the amino acids. They're just the blueprint for the amino acids. Right, right. And inside the RNA is when the actual execution of the blueprint occurs. Well, the RNA is another step. It's also a blueprint. It's, it's an intermediate step. And there are reasons this happens mechanically. So... You could say DNA is a template for the RNA and the RNA is a template for the proteins, amino acids for the proteins. But you can just make a shorthand. You could say the DNA provides a blueprint for the proteins. You can, if you eliminate the RNA step, it's still correct enough, as you could see in this table. This is the correspondence between DNA codons, which are three nucleotides, to the amino acids. And you'll have the 20 amino acids here, plus a punctuation mark we call a stop codon. And the codon is essentially one ladder rung of one half of the ladder rung of the DNA. No, that is, uh, that's a base pair. Base pair is a rung. So three rungs and, and one side of it would be a codon. Yeah. A codon is three. I was saying, huh? That's what I was saying. That's a half of a rung, three in a row. It's three rungs. It's three half rungs. Yeah, that's what I said. Okay, I'm sorry. So if you had three rungs, that would be six and it would be two codons. Um, well, if you had three rungs, it'd be codon in one direction and a codon in the other, what we call complement. But we're getting into the weeds here. But okay, but this, yeah, this is codons. Okay, so the going back to our to the letter you sent. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, maybe. Okay, let me just pause here. I have to turn down the heat. It's actually, I cut off the central. Um, circulation because uh, I had painted one room and I'm trying to and it kind of cooled off this room but now that I the central circulation's off I have my space heater it's tropical in here even though it's like 30 <laughs> degrees outside let me turn down the heat okay so don't don't worry Repetition through this, you'll start. You'll start to feel the molecular biology. Um, it'll start to be like the back of your hand. Just have you ever played a musical instrument or tried? Yeah, it was too complicated for me, and that's basically you just called it the weeds, but it's extremely complicated, multi-stepped, multifaceted, and that's the other thing about the whole thing about creating something gradually. It's multi-stepped, so you'd have to know the end product that you're going for. How would you know that you needed the particular five parts for the mousetrap? And anyway. Yes. And it's, by the way, this is the reason I, I, I'm not saying irreducibly, irreducible complexity is a bad concept. 
No, it has to be it's just bag. properly. It's See, you build a car with your... Oh, say again, I missed it. You were saying it's just a bad, it's a term that isn't easily understood and you want to replace it by it's all or nothing. How about things needed? How about, or how about unevolvable complexity? <laughs> yeah, really, huh? It's like, In well, unevolvable complexity. Uh, see, th th we're going to play the same game. If they call it natural selection, then I'll say unevolvable complexity. They have improved in natural <laughs> selection. Really. So you can't, you know, I'm just going to say, okay, if if you're going to claim natural selection with no proof, why can't I use the term unevolvable complexity? <laughs> so there are things, are, are you going to prove me wrong? Are you going to say, are, are you, okay, I'm going to say, uh, why do you assume it, it's evolvable? What proof do you have? I have plenty of proof that it's unevolvable. Well, yeah. and if you're the hammer on a mousetrap, or if you're the base that the whole mousetrap sits on, how do you know how to select anything unless you have an intelligence for the finished mousetrap? Right. You can't. Nature cannot select for what doesn't exist. Nor can it select for what is not in a blueprint, an intelligently designed blueprint. It can't select if it doesn't know what it's looking for. It requires intelligence. But you're right, that too. If you only have the DNA for a hammer, you can't select for the spring. There are numerous problems. We won't, okay, S Cindy, um, uh, we can refine the arguments a little better for l later use. It's great you're thinking this way. Um, uh, so I'm just, we'll get to that point, and I'm glad you're thinking that way. So right now we're going to, we have to get a little bit into the weeds, but not too far. Go so ahead. when you started talking about the base pairs and the rungs, it's like, okay, we don't have to get that far to understand because it's it was it's critical in my opinion, that you understand the correspondence between a codon and an amino acid. The codons are made of nucleotides, and then the proteins are made of amino acids. The amino acids correspond to the codons, and that's defined by the genetic code. So this is called, this is called the genetic code. So you keep hearing about, you know, look at the miracle of the genetic code. There has to be a lot of machinery that makes a correspondence between nucleotide codons to the amino acids in a protein. This is not, try to build them. Okay, to kind of paraphrase James Tour, I'll give you the genetic code. You build it. <laughs> you build a machine that implements the genetic code. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Build a machine that implements the genetic code. So, for example, the first one on the top, TTT. Corresponds that, to the amino acid phenylalanine. Yep. In other words, it's the instructions for how to build. It, what we call this... Yeah, what we call this in the engineering parlance, it is the specifications. Your system will build, do this. So I could say your car will be able to do all this. We don't care whether it's a carburetor or a fuel injector, but this is the specification. It turns out organisms implement, will meet most of them, not all, will meet the specifications of this genetic code. How they actually get there is a little different between organisms. And we're only learning that now. And we, we'll get into that. That's more of the molecular biology where you start to see the nuances, particularly between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. You get the same net result in the genetic code, but it goes there by its different paths. You've got to be kidding me. No, I'm not kidding you. 
That's why I was getting an Aaron and Dr. Chris's face. You tell me how a prokaryote evolved into a eukaryote or how they shared a common ancestor. I'm not kidding. Change Tan, professor of molecular cell biology, uh, graduate Ivy League, also postdoc at Harvard, selected by Nobel Prize winner. She started studying the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes because she had to teach molecular biology. So she, up until then, she had done physical organic chemistry, which is still the right qualifications to qualify her to teach molecular biology. Because if you teach physical organic chemistry, you have a lot of the chemistry you need. Molecular biology has tons and tons of chemistry. So she had just the right physical organic chemistry. She just needed a little bit of cell stuff. She started, had to learn kind of more of the, the detail specific to the central dogma and how the central dogma played out for prokaryotes and eukaryotes. You had the same kind of end result, but it's like the difference between a car that has a carburetor and a car that has fuel injectors, so to speak, figuratively speaking. But when she looked at the difference, she said, this doesn't have a common ancestor. You need miracles. She became a creationist. And that, that was the start. Then she kind of went a level lower and started writing The Stairway to Life, where she talked about the origin of life. But what really triggered it for her was looking at the central dogma and the way that prokaryotes implemented it versus eukaryotes. And I, we were hammering it in our debate with Aaron and Dr. Chris. Now, again, it wasn't exactly, I, I put you in a bad spot because I wanted you to be my partner because I got dissed by Rebecca. <laughs> so I said, I need someone to help. <laughs> it's like Rebecca, she dissed me. She dissed me. <laughs> and so I, I went, Cindy, you got to help me. You got to help me. <laughs> hurt my feelings. Yeah. So. Now we're going back, and I, you know, I said, okay, so just what you're yourself. saying is in a prokaryote and a eukaryote, the TTT still codes or corresponds to phenylalanine, but it's implemented in a different process. Yes. Holy yes. cow. Yeah. In, <laughs> And we I showed part of this in in some of the slides. Aaron wasn't interested. Dr. Chris didn't want to back me up on it. He wanted to talk about whatever they wanted to talk about, the fossils. I said, you guys are losing it on the molecular level. You're trying to get us to talk. And I said, let's talk at the molecular level. You're going to lose. They, they definitely it. did. They changed the subject to fossils, to Noah's Ark. Ark. See, what you flag. are seeing, what you're realizing now is, I'm delighted. You're seeing why this is so powerful. You can win at the university level when you talk at the molecular level. The reason I have confidence in that. Is they were slick. They were of course, slick. I was trying to tell you that they're slick. They were changing the subject like they were just totally appropriate to do so and the, it doesn't appear until retrospect wait just a cotton pick and <laughs> no, no, okay see now now you're understanding and again cindy i'm sorry i got so mad because i could see the play i totally saw it i, I totally saw what they were doing and um you know it's a lot of pressure on debate the format of modern debate modern day debate, the format that the moderator structured is terrible for arriving at the truth. It gives the advantage to the people that don't have a case, that are that are not willing to deal with data and not willing to comb through it methodically. Uh, it, it, it lends advantage to people that are just all about theater. I'm sorry, not about truth. It's about theater. And hey, I get it's it. You know. theater, Sal. It's deception. That was intentional obfuscation. Well, you know, I'm not going to try to be a mind reader. Um, no, but that's the only reason you change a subject. Because you're uncomfortable. You know you can't go there. 
Well, I don't know about Aaron. He still thinks he's won. The, he's a, there are no effing common ancestor of proteins, and he still thinks he's won the case. I'm just like, dude, you don't understand. I mean, he was saying I'm not a smart man, and I don't understand this. I'm just like, dude, uh, maybe look in the mirror, bud. Um, if you don't understand the problem, then you really don't understand. Uh, you don't really understand what's at issue. Well, honey, to go through what we're going through right now, takes a lot of concentration it takes interest it takes motivation it takes foreknowledge that god's glory is in there and they don't have any of that so basically it's like you started talking greek and they don't speak greek so they had to bow out well and you know the problem is dr chris is a professional biologist he knew what i was saying and I'm like, okay, you know, I know who you are. I know your qualifications. Everything I taught, you see, you've taken these classes. And so I don't know what to do about Dr. Chris. You should know this. And, you know, um, he believes what he wants to believe. He wanted to talk about everything except what we were putting on the table. I'm just like, okay, Dr. Chris, you know. I don't, I don't know if you watched Dr. Chris's after show. No. But he was mocking uh, your position. Um, oh, let him, you know, and, and he wanted to keep doing that. And I told him, you know, I come on your show. I'm not going to let you just, th this wouldn't be fair to me, but more importantly, my co-authors, you let me, articulate my case the way I think it should be. I'm not going to be sit there and be badgered by you yep. to answer your questions. I said, and the, by the way, the other thing is you're going to let me badger you, right? Because I'm not going to sit there and let, you know, I said, fair is fair. And he honored his word. I did my show for 40 minutes, almost exactly. And he did his show for 40 minutes. We were on the same show, but I had my 40 minutes than his. And I said, that's fair. And I said, maybe I have a feeling he'll never want to do that <laughs> format again. <laughs> well, yeah, because he's because not if we do that again, I'm gonna I'm gonna hammer him again. I'm gonna say, look, Cindy's learning this, and you are backing Aaron Raw in our emails, and you're saying, good job, Aaron. And I'm like, you, you, you know, you can't say that with a straight face anymore. Before Cindy, if if you interview me again, I'm gonna confront you. And you say, I, I'm going to tell you what, you're going to have to say with a straight face to Cindy, you figured this out and that you have an answer. And to his credit, what did we do? The letter we sent about all this, and I'll show it. The letter we sent, we said, okay, so the issue is the base of these trees here, the base of the orchard. The base of the trees in the orchard. So call it, like you said, they all have different shapes, but the more important, equally important, perhaps more so, is the spelling. So, okay, Cindy, do you see? This is the zinc finger here, and this is a collagen. As you can see, different shapes. Zinc finger is kind of, this is a conceptual diagram. It's really hard to show it. This is very close to the actual shape. So some of these, you know, this is definitely an approximation, but it does not, is not shaped like a collagen. The powerful thing is the spelling is different. This is the collagen. Unfortunately, it's on the left side here. And this is the zinc finger. So the amino acids have there. Let me see if I can get away with this. Uh, slideshow. Yeah, they use the word morphology. You're talking about the shape. That's basically all morphology is. Morph means form. Yeah. And right. they talk they use the word morphology like they're some big scientist, but basically all it means is you're comparing the shape. Okay. So now you see the spelling. On the left is the collagen actually only one part of the collagen, but this is good enough. Now, do you see the spelling? So what do the letters represent? That's Code, a rhetorical codons. question. 
Codons. Amino acids. Amino acids. Amino acids. You'll, you'll get it. Just practice. Okay. okay. But isn't and it an the amino codon acid that... corresponds? An amino acid corresponds to a codon. Just sometimes more than one codon. That's right. right. So M is for methionine, F is for phenylalanine, S is for serine, F for phenylalanine, V for valine. I think D is aspartic acid, L is leucine, R is arginine, leucine, 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 A is for alanine, T is for threonine, I think, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Q is like glutamine, glutamate, I'll get it right eventually. But 20, can you see 20 amino acids? 20 canonical amino acids. Okay. Con add the word canonical and you'll be good. Yeah. All right. Now there's a G here. Can you, I don't know if you could barely see my pointer. There's a G. G is for glycine. Every third amino acid in the sequence is a glycine. So just read this like a paragraph where you wrap around. Isn't that a striking pattern? That's a non-random pattern. Correct. An accident will not make that, you know. A what? An accident will not make this beautiful pattern. You see yeah. that nice, okay? We're lucky that you could visualize this. You know, us humans, that is. Now, um, you could see there is a C here. This is a zinc finger. You have C, and then two letters later, you have another C. And then down, farther down, you have H's. And that is a signature of zinc finger. This, the cysteine, C for cysteine, H for histidine. And then there are some that fall in the same group. Um, so even if they're slightly different, if they're different letters, but they're in the same family, I've color coded them according to group colors. And so you could see these patterns there. They are real patterns. They define it will, it is important to making this geometry. So there's the collagen, that particular pattern of G's helps give the shape of the collagen. And then the particular pattern of cysteines and histidines makes the zinc finger have their pattern. So there's no effing common ancestor for all proteins. That's why. <laughs> I don't think there's any common ancestor for the amino acids either or any of it. None uh, of it. Well, study more molecular biology before you get to that point. But yeah. we, we could start with what Aaron Ra and Dr. Chris conceded. For all the major protein families, there's no effing common ancestor. And you could defend that. They agreed with it. At this point, you don't have to defend it. But it does pose a problem. They'll say, that's not a problem for evolution. I'm like, uh, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. How, how, you're gonna, how, can, you have, how can you have a metazoan? that needs collagen and you don't evolve the collagen and you need five, you need five proteins to implement a collagen. You need the collagen protein. You need the glycolysation protein. You need the peptidases, um, proteinases, uh, the, uh, prolyl, uh, prolyl hydroxylases. And you need some other things too. So at least five, probably more, for sure. And um, it, it's not going to work unless they're all there, as far, far as we know. You can claim that there was co-option or some other repurposing, but that's just a speculation. So what did we ask them? And we'll look at what we asked them specifically. Let me see if I could bring this up. We asked them about the bases of these trees. So we asked, you asked, and I'm glad you wrote this, question, do you claim the bases of each tree in the protein orchard emerged by descent with inherited modification 
starting from a known, verified, proven, described in detail sequence via a known, verified, proven, described in detail process in order to arrive at a known, verified, proven, described in detail base of a tree. <laughs> so you tell me how this came about. Do you have that? And I knew they didn't. I forgot about that. That was the main point you wanted to hammer, that they are making a faith statement. Yes. You don't have to prove creation to start to win, you know, to start to score serious points against them. All you have to do is ask them, why do you believe this? And Aaron says, it's fact. And I said, okay, you claim it's fact. Why don't you provide the facts? We just asked, you asked, and again, it's a letter that Cindy and I talked about. Cindy sent the letter. You asked 12 facts. They could answer this. <laughs> Do you remember their answer? Did, it, did they answer your question? <laughs> no, I was waiting for you to put it up on the screen. Okay, I don't have it handy right now. Okay. But... This is why you're going to win if you learn molecular biology. You're going to have you're going to command the debate next time. You'll own them if, but you need debate skills. But now you're I'm trying to equip you to have. The other thing is now you can you'll have the you'll have the you'll have kind of at least the knowledge base enough to start, and at least you could show the videos. But you'll have comprehension of what's being described. So. The last Illustra media clip we had was of the bacterial flagellum, and they're talking about all the parts. The parts are made of proteins. The proteins have a spelling to give them their shape and their properties. So when you change the, the spelling, spelling is codons. Spelling in the DNA is codons. The codons translate to amino acids that have that particular sequence in the protein comprise proteins right so proteins have spelling how does the protein get many of its essential properties it's it's the sequence it's the spelling of the protein basically yeah. you spell the protein okay so if you have a protein that looks like collagen the reason it looks that way is because There's a spelling. <laughs> Collagen is spelled that way. Therefore, it's going to have that shape. Zinc fingers are spelled this way, and it has that shape. A topoisomerase is spelled a different way. It has a different shape. And by the way, it's really incredible that you can control shape by spelling things differently. And it's really hard. If I asked the biochemist, I said, make the shape of a collagen, and he didn't know God's pattern before. I think he would just want to take a gun and blow his brains out because it's, the problem is so hard. It's what they call, it's related to the protein folding problem. If you start with a particular spelling, how does it tell us what shape it's going to be? We're starting to solve that problem, but we actually have to borrow God's designs. We build a library and compare it to pre-existing shapes, so we sort of cheat. But if we had to do this from first principles of physics, it's brutal. It's brutal. You know, so if you're asking me, you know, how is it that if you spell it a certain way, it's going to adopt the shape? It's like, that's really complicated. <laughs> you're getting into some serious, serious physics. So. You're getting into some conceptual stuff that our brain it's like having to visualize in 4D or something. Yes. Our yes. brain doesn't do it. Mine so, doesn't anyway. Do you want, to, I mean, we we were backstage for about an hour and a half. We're already going on two hours. Do you want to just uh, reconvene? Yeah. And we'll finish. Okay. So, um, I, I interrupted you quite a bit here because I wanted to direct the conversation toward molecular biology, but no, that's okay. speak freely now. Speak freely now. 
That's okay, because I need so much repetition, I don't think it would be good fodder for the audience. Okay. It, I, it's okay. okay. I wanted to, if I get to speak freely, I want to go back to the spellings. And those letters are not the ACTG. Those letters are the, don't tell me. No, you have to tell me. Those okay. letters are the codons. Amino acids. Amino acids. Okay. The letters in the spellings? Okay, hang on. Um, let me, let me show you something. All right. Oh, right, 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 right. We'll, right. we'll work, we'll work through right. this. We have two alphabets. We have the ACTG, and then we have the single letters that stand for the amino acids that are the codon. The codon uh, corresponds to those amino acids, which are represented by single letters. Now I Correct. Remember. Okay, so the amino acids, so we have the amino acid code, and I'm going to show it right here. Okay, we assigned these letters, but it really, you know, this is the convention we just gave A for alanine in the amino acid code. And you can see A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, N, V, W, X, and Y, and Z. W, <laughs> no, you need to put an X there, not a Y. <laughs> anyway, so even now, the English alphabet has 26 letters. And so there are times when they'll use a letter, like say Z, and they'll say either be glutamic or gl glutamine, Q. And there are these non-canonical ones like this selenocysteine. It's rare, but it's not one of the canonical ones. And then py pyrolysine. Okay, so, so we can take all the English alphabetical letters, and it can be like, it may, something like B might be two possible amino acids, or a J is another two possible. But, you know, th this is deep in the weeds now. But just think 20 canonical. So it's close to the English alphabet. In contrast, uh, ACTG is ACTG is the DNA alphabet. A is for adenine, C is for cytosine, G for guanine, T for thymine. Now this is where it gets confusing. A is for adenine for nucleotides, but A is for alanine for amino acids. The names sound very sim similar, and that's kind of hard. Makes it hard. Wait a minute. Alanine versus adenine adenine wow okay. all right so don't feel bad okay so molecular my molecular i mean i'm sorry biochemistry biochemistry is like memorizing a phone book so um you know i mean when you meet people you start to remember names like the difference between adrian and arlene um, right. Right. It, just think biochemistry is going to be the same way. Uh, you'll start to hear things that sound similar, but you'll eventually distinguish between the two. And then you just, ultimately, you'll probably start to distinguish between their characteristics and how they bond yes. with other things. And just like, you know, Adam versus Arlene, you're going to have you're going to know Arlene's behavior and characteristics and Adam's. Right. So, so, so just be so no. complicated. Well, I'm being patient here because uh, this is, this just takes repetition. But once you learn the language, um, you'll have command of this. It just takes repetition. So, you know, um, I mean, old school. Okay, I'll tell you when I was taking biochemistry, old school, I had an old school professor. He said, the way you're going to do this is you'll have index cards. And on the exam, you're going to know the DNA alphabet and the amino acid alphabet. You're going to draw the molecules. And however long it takes, just take the index card. 
And so I would say, okay, A is for adenine. And, and I would, you know, I'd say ACTG, and then I'd write down the name of the nucleotide for DNA, and I'd draw the molecule. So now you can imagine how long this took. And then I'd have to do that for also the uh, amino acids. But then I realized, look, the little kids are able to learn their alphabet by first grade. And they're singing it, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, you know, and, and that's kind of how I did it. And I said, okay, then, okay, you know, and I would just go down the alphabet. And if I got 20, then I know I was probably, that's a good sanity check. And then I could draw, I had to draw the chemicals. So how long did that take me? That probably took me at least 11 hours of memorization. But and what does really the difficult part about memorization is if you just memorize the letters, then you don't have the content. You have to memorize right. not just the letters, but the content, the context. I mean, it's wow, you're blowing right. my mind. But it starts with that rote memorization, it's a start. But if you think about it, this is only 16. You, can, you have the 20 amino acids, and then the four DNAs. Even I don't know all the amino acids off the top of my head anymore. I did for the exam, but what you have is, I'm not asking, I'm not suggesting you memorize. Understand what this table represents. It yeah, shows the relationship. Okay. I'm working on that. So even I, if I have to look at this, I mean, if I have to, you know, do something professionally, I will look up this table, but at least I know this, I know what table I need to look for. It has this form. Right. So, all right. So what do the, what do the T's represent here? Well, you called it threonine, but I thought it was thiamine. Okay. Thiamine is the DNA. Oh, jeepers. <laughs> kind okay. of like the arginine and the adenine. Okay. A adenine. Okay. T. Okay. All right. The DNA alphabet is only four letters, so it's going to be easier. All right. I don't even have those yet. Okay. Um. But right now, I need to go night night because my eyes are getting dry. It's midnight. Yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll resume this. Okay, before we go on then, um, just think for next time, think how I could be of service to you. Do you feel that you have moved forward in your understanding? Well, yes, and part of it is just the repetition. And I'm not seeing as much connection between the movie and the... the um, the molecular chemistry. You will in the later episodes. You will absolutely see it. You'll absolutely see it because there's, you're going to see, you're going to see transcription. You're going to see translation. You will. And the whole movie is directed to that part. I mean, the highlight of the movie, in my opinion, was when they showed transcription and translation. And Dean Kenyon, who was, kind of on the side of Dave Farina many years ago. Not, not that he liked the guy, didn't, you know, Dave wasn't even born, but he was an origin of life researcher. He switched sides after he considered the transcription translation What's process. His name? Dean Kenyon. So we can watch. Testimony. Yeah, oh, it's beautiful. So we can, we can cover that next time. Is it on the internet? Yes. And, and it's I also have it in, I have a whole playlist of testimonies. It's it's on the internet in a text form. It made the Wall Street Journal because it was scandalous. Because when he flipped, he was persecuted. They punished him for telling the truth. Wow. Tell me his name again. Dean Kenyon. And he's in the Illustra Media video. So we'll, we might play the first 20 minutes because we were having technical problems earlier. Well, if you can find... Yeah, I had... It several times, and when I went out and came back, it went away. Yeah. But if you sure. could find his testimony, I would love 
even if it's just in written form, I will read it yes, on my I, channel. Can, can you know, I'm getting, I'm kind of overwhelmed. If you give me a minute, I'll look it up right now. I'll send it to you and then we can review it on our next show. We will have a next show, won't we? That'd be great. Yeah. Dean Kenyon, Stephen Meyer. Uh, okay, let me see. Dean Canyon, Stephen Meyer. Wall Street Journal, Wall Street Journal. Let's see if it picks it up. Okay, th there is, it's been a long time since we had the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Yeah, okay, I'll send you this one, but there's an older article that happened around the time. Okay, this is 30 years ago when the scandal broke out. So it's been retold, and unfortunately, you know how, you know, details are left out. Uh, but I'm, I'm sending it to you now just as a starter. Um, and, and we could, you're very good at looking stuff up in the internet. Um, you can read this and you can learn you know, if you want to investigate it more, that'd be great. It'd be great to read it on your channel. And if you find something that's better than the article that I sent you, we can read it on this channel on one of our shows on molecular biology. Because the highlight of um, what Kenyon was working on was explaining the transcription and the translation process. And he said, uh, intelligent design is a better explanation. <laughs> Chemistry cannot explain it so okay i just sent it to you and i can close this in prayer and uh, i can see if i have any branding music just to end this, the show uh i'll cue that up give me one moment and, okay so i'll close this in prayer cindy and thank you for your time do you have any closing thoughts before we say goodbye that you'd like to communicate to the audience? Um, no. I just need to put all the pieces together in my head, the arguments with the science, etc. cetera. Okay. Glory and honor to our Lord and Savior. I'll close this in prayer. Dear Lord, um, thank you for all the good things you're doing in Cindy's life. Help her to recover from all the evils that have uh, have come upon her. We thank you. We remember the story of Naomi and all the suffering she went through, but you had a plan for her life and for our, uh, that family led to the, uh, was the lineage of King David, which is the lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Lord, you have a plan for all, you work all things for the good of those who love you. We thank you uh, for this show and ask uh, that you would use it to your glory. And uh, please be with Cindy and I until we may reconvene uh, another molecular biology show. We thank you for having the opportunity to declare your great and mighty works and your great wisdom and how you constructed all things. And we honor you for this. And... Uh, Dear Lord, just help us to deal with all the everyday problems in this fallen and cursed world. Help us to wait upon you and, and to, to have our hope in you because this world is passing away, but Jesus' words abide forever. And it's in his blessed name we pray, amen. And so guys, I'm now going to just uh, close. Uh, hey, you know, because uh, we're doing this by recording. I can play something for you that I couldn't if we were a live stream. 
So here it is for you. This is a song that Cindy really likes, and that's why I'm going to play it. I stand in awe of you. Like nothing ever seen or 